Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ, and to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture and our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we are continuing our series on the Augsburg Confession, today covering Article 13 on the use of the sacraments. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point and St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois, and my companion confessor in conversation about this article today is Pastor Timothy Sims. He is senior pastor of St. John Lutheran Church and School in Chester, Illinois. Pastor Sims, welcome back to Concord Matters. Good to be here. Thank you. It's a privilege. Yeah, privileged to have you on. We've had you on back in the old days when we did panel discussions. Uh, at least one time we had you on there. I know you joined me in that. And mm-hmm. a pleasure to have you back on, especially to talk today about the use of the sacraments, which we see in this progression. We've just covered in the previous articles those sacraments and then how they relate to repentance. And then this next progression here is this article on the use of the sacraments. And So it's going to pick up a lot of those themes that we've just covered. But as we get started here today, I'm just going to go ahead and read the article in its entirety here, and then we'll jump into discussing it. So, of course, on this show, we read from Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, available to you from Concordia Publishing House, the publishing arm of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And this is Article 13 from the Augsburg Confession on the Use of the Sacraments. Our churches teach that the sacraments were ordained not only to be marks of profession among men, but even more to be signs and testimonies of God's will towards us. They were instituted to awaken and confirm faith in those who use them. Therefore, we must use the sacraments in such a way that faith, which believes the promises offered and set forth through the sacraments, is increased, as 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3 talks about. Therefore, they condemn those who teach that the sacraments justify simply by the act of doing them. They condemn those who do not teach that faith, which believes that sins are forgiven, is required in the use of the sacraments. All right, that is the entirety of Article 13 from the Augsburg Confession on the use of the sacraments there. Pastor Sims, go ahead and get us into this article. I think it's a good place to start with the history kind of behind this article, why this article, what's their concerns here that the Lutheran confessors are including this article and putting this forward here? Yeah, that's a good question. And you touched on something in your introduction there to this article. Sometimes if you're just kind of quickly going through the Augsburg Confession and you see this, and maybe when you read it, it may seem a bit redundant. Didn't we just get done talking about, you know, baptism and the Lord's Supper and so forth? And yes, those have been addressed, and yet this is going to address a specific issue with the use of the sacraments of Christ's church and address some problems that are going on. I think maybe one of the better ways to look at the problems that exist are kind of like two sides of one very problematic coin. On one side, you seem to have a stress with the Roman church at the time that it really is about the power of the priests, and even to the point that when the priests administer the sacraments, they are gaining their own merits for their own sake, not simply doing them for the sake of those who receive it, okay? The other side is a significant misunderstanding, both on the side of laity and the priestly orders, regarding how these sacraments are efficacious or are a blessing to the people. And, uh, you know, in the reader's edition, I I like the way they did this because sometimes scholarly terms can kind of just bog us down. And in the reader's edition, in that second portion that you read, it says, they condemn those who teach that the sacraments justify, 
simply by the act of doing them. And the fancy word for that, that we see in the apology as well, especially unpacked, is a Latin term that is ex opere operato, which means basically what the reader's edition uses there. It's very helpful. It basically just means that the sacraments are efficacious or a blessing to the one who receives them or gives them simply by the mere act without any connection of faith. And that is very problematic in regard to what we see in the scriptures and therefore became very problematic for the Lutheran reformers because the sacraments were being abused to the point that people really didn't think that a connection of faith or sacraments and faith working together were really important at all or mattered. And so people were just receiving the sacrament without much concern about whether there was faith, and priests and others were administering the sacraments without real concern about whether there was faith in the recipient or maybe even the case in, say, infant baptism, whether there was continued faith after the fact and so on. And so the Lutheran reformers really wanted to address this so that there was not the misunderstanding regarding how the sacraments are to be used and also how they are efficacious or a blessing to those who receive them. You highlighted there several times this constant refrain that just continues to come in with every article here, that it's about the faith. It's about the faith. And so, of course, that brings us back to the chief article on justification. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But before we actually get there, I want to walk us through kind of a little bit, almost line by line here, as we kind of deal with the teaching of the doctrine that they're putting forward here, which you highlighted really well for us. That's why they put this forward historically and so forth and what their concern is. As we look at that first line, it says, our churches teach that the sacraments were ordained not only to be marks of profession among men, but even more to be signs and testimonies of God's will toward us. What do we mean by that? What are they talking about with those signs and testimonies of God's will toward us there? Well, they were signs, not merely about which you know, the church would say, okay, this is what it looks like to be church, but also signs by which people may recognize not only that, but recognize God's will and work for their sake. So these aren't merely identifiers or something that we just do as the church, but they are things that Christ has instituted Because, and the way I like to put it is, he established Sabbath and the divine service throughout the history of God's people and then into the New Testament after Christ. Because in these gifts of the sacraments, there are gifts that Christ was literally dying to give us that he wants us to have. And it's because they give us forgiveness, life, and salvation. So they're not simply things by which we'll recognize outwardly what the church is or who they are but signs that point us towards God's will for us and what he wants us to have and who we, he's made us into in baptism and faith. As you talked about Christ instituting that then, that leads us into that next line there, that they were instituted to awaken and confirm the faith in those who use them. What does that mean? Awaken and confirm. So we believe faith is a gift, right? We confess in the creed that We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. And then in Luther's explanation for that, in the catechism, he enlightens us with his gifts. Enlightened. He he shows us who we are and brings about faith. Okay? So a good way to look at that, to awaken into and also keep us in the true faith, I think baptism is a great example of that. We are given the gift of faith. You know, when a baby's baptized, for example, they are given the gift of faith. The Holy Spirit goes into them and gives them that gift. And yet that gift also needs to be, continue to be nurtured and to grow in the young Christian, young on the calendar or not, if they're a new Christian, 
they need to continue to be nurtured in the sacraments as well so that it not only is faith awakened, but also the person continues in that faith for their forgiveness, life, and salvation. I like that connection, especially as you use baptism there, that you know, we even have this within our order in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, generally speaking, right? You know, we, we have baptism most of the time as an infant. Of course, we know that that can happen at any age uh, where faith is awakened. Sure. But then that always leads to the confirmation of the faith when they stand and say that faith that I was baptized into is my faith. And that faith has been confirmed, or we might also say strengthened. And that's one of the ways that I like to highlight it is, is that it's strengthened in that child as they grow in their baptism towards their confirmation. And then even after confirmation, it continues to be strengthened in us as we continue to hear that word and receive the sacraments. And so I like that progression that it takes us through here of this is exactly the Christian life, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is so important because, you know, you and I are focusing very much on the positive aspect of faith being strengthened after we already have it. It's not like it's not a saving faith initially. It is, but it it can be strengthened and is strengthened by the continued gifts of word and sacrament, things that the Holy Spirit uses to keep us in the one true faith. Because in the absence of those things and continued life of word and sacrament, not only does faith, is it not strengthened, but it can also actually wither and die. And so certainly Christ has instituted his sacraments and gathers us for his divine service, especially so that that faith continues to be nurtured and strengthened and doesn't simply wither and die. And that connects us nicely to what we just came out of in the Augsburg Confession with Article 12 on repentance, where we talked very specifically uh, and even condemned several groups that said that basically, if you fall after baptism into sin, there's no hope for you. You're done. And we said, no, we (laughs) condemn that, right? Right. And we specifically made a part of our confession on terms of repentance. And that, of course, flows forth from confession that, no, this is the faith at work that leads us into repentance. And so what a great comfort it is that the sacraments are there to awaken at first, but then also to confirm, to strengthen us both when we've fallen and as we seek to lead our Christian lives in God-pleasing ways. Amen to that. I, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that I have all 95 theses that Luther put on the Wittenberg chapel door memorized, but I will tell you, uh, I know what the first one was, and it's kind of perceived to be the most important one from which all the others flow, and that is simply using my own paraphrase, the life of the Christian is one lived in perpetual repentance. The idea that either A, if you're really a Christian, you're not going to sin again, is not biblical. The idea that as a Christian who's baptized into Christ, you may sin, but you don't really need to repent anymore because you already have forgiveness is not really what we see in the scriptures either. Um, I love what uh, those who put the faithful liturgies together for us have done with what's now Divine Service 1 in our Lutheran service book the quote from 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those are written in the present tense to the church. So it's not about people who haven't believed or been baptized yet. It's about those who are already baptized believers who are in the church in our continued life of repentance and the reception and renewal that comes with Christ's forgiveness. Yeah. And as we're talking here, too, about, you know, that it would be strengthened in us is the language I like to use, this confirmed in the faith. The next line also connects in here, too. As a matter of fact, in the reader's edition of the Book of Concord that we use, it's still a part of paragraph two, but it's its own sentence. It says, therefore, we must use the sacraments in such a way that faith, which believes the promises offered and set forth through the sacraments, is increased. And sometimes we Lutherans may be a little uncomfortable with using that word increase. Yeah. But uh, what do you want to say about that line there? Well, I mean, yeah, I think you're right because we, we have, I think maybe rightfully so, we have this sensitivity towards, wait, what do you mean by increasing faith? You know, we're not about measuring who has the greater faith. We're not about saying, well, if you have enough faith, then you'll be saved. No, we believe that 
in the scriptures, what's made clear is faith is as strong as the object in which it's placed. Even a small faith, like a mustard seed. That being said, once we are baptized into Christ and made his own, the devil doesn't just give up. And he's constantly, the, the unholy trinity, the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh are constantly trying to get us to doubt and not be in faith. And yet what we see with the use of the sacraments is that they're given so that we are strengthened in our faith for that everyday battle. And these gifts increase our strength in faith in Christ. Absolutely. Do you want to go ahead and bring in some of the scripture passages at this point that help support this confession that we've made here uh, as we're kind of looking at the positive, uh, you know, if we were in the formula of Concord, we would have the positive confession of our faith and then the, the negative, which are the things that we condemn and reject and so forth. But we have a similar thing going on in the Augsburg Confession here. So as we have kind of this positive presentation of our confession of faith here on the use of the sacraments, we'll get to the what we condemn here in a little bit. But uh, what's the scripture passages? Of course, they bring in Second Thessalonians 1, 3 there. But what are the other things that help support this confession of our faith that we've put forward here? Well, I think a great place to go is, first of all, Jesus teaching in Matthew 28, just before he ascends, and then also what we see in the early church. So, in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we see a very clear command, sometimes called the Great Commission. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's been given to him. And now he says, go therefore and make disciples by baptizing and teaching by baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And right there, you have a lot going on in just very few words. Looking at it just sacramentally and the use of the sacraments, first of all, obviously, baptism is there, right? And that's powerful, but that's the beginning of a life of discipleship. There also needs to be teaching that goes along with it to make sure strengthening of faith and increase of faith occurs. And then also that even just that command, lo, I am with you always to the very end of time. How exactly is he with us? Well, we know that he instituted his Holy Supper to be with us in a remarkably powerful way so that we actually take inside of ourselves by the mouth his very body and blood. And in faith, trusting in that, in humble, repentant faith, we receive not only his body and blood, which everybody, regardless of their faith, would receive, we also then receive forgiveness, life, and salvation. And that obviously strengthens us. You move on to the book of Acts, and one of my favorite stretches is the story of Pentecost in the book of Acts, not only because of what happens with the way God uses powerfully the preaching of Peter, and the arrival of the Holy Spirit, bringing all those people to be baptized, men and women of all ages, but also what happens immediately afterwards, where we see this. Uh, This is Acts 2, beginning at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And obviously, There's the whole descriptive and prescriptive discussions, well, I think are always appropriate, but rightfully so, faithful Christianity has always come to see that as the worship life of the church for the sake of the baptized after they are brought in through baptism. And what we see there is that the sacramental presence of Jesus continues. The breaking of the bread is a phrase used for the sharing of the Lord's Supper, and then we know as we continue throughout the rest of the New Testament, receiving the Eucharist, the the very body and blood of Christ, hidden under bread and wine, as part of the worship life of the church continues as they gather each week, and that continues to be Jesus being with them always. You know, sometimes I think we struggle with where do we go looking for Jesus? And sometimes, kind of like the old country song, we go looking for love in all the wrong places. We look for Jesus in all kinds of places where he's never promised to be. And yet we stay away from the things 
through which he has promised to be with us powerfully. Uh, If you want to look for Jesus and find him, go to the sanctuary and the altar, because we know that he's promised to be there and give us his gifts to keep us in the one true faith through the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation that they bring. Yeah. As you were talking there, I was thinking that, and especially that Acts 1 is what made me think of this, you were highlighting baptism and the Lord's Supper as the sacraments for us. And of course, we commonly talk that way. And of course, as we talked about in Article 11 on confession, which of course also includes absolution as part of it, at times we Lutherans may include that as a sacrament, but we don't really quibble over how many sacraments we have and those sorts of things. We continue to accent the faith. And there's much more that we want to talk about here. At this point, I think, and we probably should have already covered this, actually, that it's interesting that for the Roman Catholics, they have seven sacraments. And as a matter of fact, in the Apology, well, actually, in the Confutation, when the Catholics respond to this, they rather demand that the Lutherans teach that there are exactly seven sacraments. Right. Uh, And in the Apology, we respond to that. What do you have for us as far as when we're talking about the use of the sacraments here, uh, while not explicitly put forward in this article, I think it's incumbent upon us to talk about what are the sacraments that we're talking about here and how do we handle this? Are there seven? Are there two? Are there three? You know, that kind of thing going on there. Yeah, this is addressed, as you mentioned, in much greater detail in the Apology, of course, because that's after a response from the Roman Church. And they make some things very clear there. As it's mentioned there, actually, we are careful not to enumerate, and yet if you actually go to the Apology, what we see is that three are talked about. From the Apology, it says, therefore, the sacraments are actually baptism, the Lord's Supper, and absolution, as it's called, or the sacrament of repentance. And so, if you look at the writings of Luther and the Lutheran confessions, it does at times look inconsistent. Sometimes there are direct references to two. Sometimes there are direct references to three. I don't think we necessarily need to quibble about that. I think we should simply say, hey, baptism and the Lord's Supper and confession and absolution are things that Christ has given his church that continue to give us forgiveness of sins and therefore life and salvation. Where you run into some problems with The rest of those that are on the list, not only of the Roman Catholic Church, but also very similarly in the Eastern Church, you run into some things that sometimes we may see as very wonderful and helpful. On the other hand, are they sacraments? Do they actually convey grace and give forgiveness, life, and salvation? That's where it really becomes problematic for the Lutheran Reformers. So, in the scenario of confirmation, We still do confirmation in the Lutheran Church. It's important because it's, especially for those who are baptized as little babies, they're basically confirming the faith into which they were baptized, and it's also the Church's way of welcoming, having been instructed and examined, welcoming young disciples or old disciples to the Lord's table to then receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. However, it's not something that we see actually in the Bible named specifically, and it certainly isn't necessary for salvation. Then you get into things like marriage. Marriage, boy, I'll tell you what, this side of heaven, can you think of a better gift? (laughs) I can't, boy, what a blessing marriage is. And yet, does marriage give me forgiveness, life, and salvation? Did Christ ever say that? No. He really didn't, and so we need to be careful about that. Um, It's a wonderful blessing, but it doesn't really give what Christ was earning for us and giving to us by his death on the cross. Then, of course, if you're going to have marriage, and then you're also going to insist on a celibate priesthood, well, then you have to find ways for people who can't be married to somehow get this gift of grace through the sacraments if you're the Roman church. So then they also added the monastic orders of the priesthood. It all just kind of becomes problematic in the sense that you don't have a clear command from Christ regarding any of those other 
items in being necessary for salvation and actually conveying and giving the grace and mercy of Christ. You do have a very clear command from Christ to baptize and to teach along with that, and also to forgive the sins of those who are repentant. That's John 20. And also, we have a clear command to do the Lord's Supper, and he makes it very clear that he gives his grace, his forgiveness through that. So, where it's very clear, we should be very clear in these other areas, maybe they could be useful things, they could be a blessing, but they don't necessarily fall into the same category of giving us forgiveness, life, and salvation. That, for the Lutheran Reformers, was what was the big difference between the enumeration that we had from the Roman Catholic Church and what we ended up keeping as Lutheran Reformers. Yeah, especially when we talk about marriage there. You know, Martin Luther would often talk about marriage and family as being a great training ground of faith. And I would certainly wholeheartedly agree with that, right? I mean, we certainly learn a lot about faith and should exercise confession and forgiveness in our marriage and family. But there's no promise of God's grace that gives me forgiveness, life, and salvation, as you say. There's nothing that inherently brings the faith just by being in marriage. Again, great training ground, but nothing instills the faith. And we can see that just obviously at how many are married and yet are completely outside of the faith. And especially those who make a mockery of it with homosexual marriage and those sorts of issues going around our culture and things. I mean, if that delivered faith, well, then there's a real problem there. And we would fight even harder than we do for the right definition of what marriage is, if that were the case. And then, like you say, too, you know, being pastors and so forth within the clergy, uh, I would say probably great training ground for us. (laughs) You learn a lot as you try to lead as an under shepherd (laughs) about living a life of faith dependent on Christ and his promises. But nothing uh, humbles you more than realizing that just being in the office does not confer the faith in and of itself, right? Indeed. Yeah. And I, I love the way you bring about that training ground idea because For those who are already in the grace of Christ, it's a great taste, and I mean just a small one, of the love of Christ for us to be in a position of, say, husband, where Paul writes, we are to love with agape, sacrificial love, as Christ gave himself up for the church. So, as I go about my life as a husband, every day should be a reminder of, okay, I'm supposed to love my bride the way Christ loves his bride, the church. Can I actually even do that? That's daunting. There's no way I can actually do that. And yet it's a great training ground, if for nothing else, for us to simply appreciate what Christ actually gives up and gives to us in the sacraments. Because, you know, we're talking about what we sacrifice for the sake of our brides, and then, you know, Christ, he does that for all people. He's willing to do that, regardless of whether there's going to be any reciprocation, regardless of whether anybody's going to love him back or not, that's what he's willing to do. And of course, that appreciation can be passed on into the work that we do in the church as well. So, it is a great training ground, but am I receiving extra? I mean, that gets into the whole problem even with, you know, what the priesthood was doing, where sometimes people were actually getting into the priesthood for very self-serving reasons instead of sacrificial reasons, because they saw it as a guarantee that they'll actually earn merits for heaven, as opposed to out of gratitude for what Christ has done, saying, you know what? God's going to use me to continue to give this gift to all kinds of other people. And it kind of turns the servanthood of the pastoral office on its head, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. And even as you use that phrase there, earn merits for heaven, that makes me actually think of the next line and what we condemn, that we condemn those who teach that the sacraments just simply by the act of doing them, you know, that just doing these things will earn us those merits for heaven in a sense. So anyway, we need to take a break here, but we will pick that up on the other side of the break, this idea of just doing the sacraments for the sake of doing them 
and what we condemn there in this article as well. And then we'll also talk about how this confession is still relevant for us. We'll pick that up on the other side of the break with our guest today, Pastor Timothy Sims. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, and you're listening to Concord Banners on KFUO. The word of Christ comes forth from his mouth as a sharp, two-edged sword. By that word, he puts our sin to death, and he raises us to new life in him. Join me, Pastor Timothy Apple, on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on KFUO, as guest pastors from around the world lead us into the word of God to help us sharpen our faith in Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue talking with our guest today, Pastor Timothy Sims. He is senior pastor of St. John Lutheran Church and School in Chester, Illinois. And we are talking about Article 13 from the Augsburg Confession on the use of the sacraments. And in the first half of the show today, we set up, you know, what's the historical background? Why include this article on the use of the sacraments in our Lutheran Confession that we put forward in the Augsburg Confession? And we gave sort of the positive, if you will, teaching. This is our doctrine that we confess. But as we often see in all of these articles, and especially see when we get to the formula of Concord and so forth, there's also that negative aspect of our confession, which is we have to be specific about the things that we reject and condemn that are not a part of our teaching. And in that, we'll oftentimes see very specific groups or teachers within the church specifically condemned for their teaching that they're put forward there. Or sometimes we'll see the more broad teaching. And that's what we have here today. And so we have this last paragraph and how this article ends here with, therefore, they, that being our Lutheran churches, condemn those who teach that the sacraments justify simply by the act of doing them. And they condemn those who do not teach that faith, which believes that sins are forgiven as required in the use of the sacraments. So kind of a couple things going on there, and especially that first one, you know, we have that good old Latin phrase there, ex opere operato, right? Mm -hmm. That Latin translation, by the act of doing them, simply by the act of doing them. So go ahead and give us that one, and then we'll get into the second statement there. Sure. And here again, there's two sides to it. So what was really rampant in the Roman church at the time was that both the priest, simply by the act of doing them, would merit grace. And so that was a problem. And then you also had amongst the laity, the people of the church, a big struggle with simply going to do these things. And I would actually use that word, do these things, as opposed to receive in faith these things. So, they would make sure that someone was baptized. They would go to Mass for the Lord's Supper, but whether they believed or not, say after baptism, not so important. Whether they believed even as they were receiving the sacrament, not of such great importance, but just the fact that they were doing them. Because, number one, there was a meritorious system in play where you had to rack those things up, and the more times you went and the more you did them, the more merits you had, not only for salvation in general, but get you out of purgatory earlier kind of thing. And so, the emphasis went away from actually trusting in, as you receive these gifts, what Christ is giving you, to just make sure you go do it. And that's really what's most important not necessarily whether you believe or trust in much of anything. And it was becoming a big problem both for the priesthood and also for the people whom they were serving in this regard. Yeah, so in that sense, you actually see the statements are quite related, right? That faith is required for the proper use of these sacraments. And it's interesting that you see, well, first of all, they don't name a specific group or teacher here. I think because this is the thing that you generally see in the Augsburg Confession, when they're actually condemning <laughs> the Roman Catholics who they're confessing this before the Holy Roman Emperor, right? Right. <laughs> you know, they give this more general statement, but it's true. And 
that is what had developed very clearly in the church. And then the irony is, is that with the teaching of the uh, grace by faith alone, you know, all the, the solas of the Reformation that Luther sought to recover that faithful teaching of in the church, what ends up happening? Well, first they were doing it just because simply doing it gives me God's grace. Oh, well, I have God's grace through faith. Uh, well, they just dropped the faith and then they stopped coming all together. I think that's interesting uh, as you look at the history, mm-hmm. what happened there. And not to jump straight to the contemporary applications, there's a lot that we can talk about, you know, where this still matters for our confession. But I think it's interesting that for us today, we've kind of gone back to the Roman thing. I mean, I don't want to specifically say that I can see the heart of any parishioner that I'm a pastor to and so forth, but you certainly see this in our churches, right? That you know, there are some that just come sit in the pews just because I'm there. Well, obviously I'm going to be in heaven, right? I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think, you know, this is still a big problem and it's a big problem in our church. And I always say our church, I mean, specifically Lutherans, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The problem of the sacraments, the idea that they are efficacious ex opere operato is still a big problem simply by merely the act of doing them is still a big problem. Now, one thing I do want to clarify that maybe I should have done earlier, but I guess I'll bring us into this discussion with this. We do want to make clear the power of the sacraments is in the word and promise of God and Christ, period. That's not really the issue here. When they're done according to Christ's institution, the promise is there. Christ does what he promises to do, and they are powerful. The issue comes in this, they only prove to be efficacious for the recipient when there is faith in Christ and what is promised. When one comes or is brought or brings someone with the idea that by the mere act, okay, we're going to get this covered and we got this done and now it's all good, is just a dangerous way to look at it. This has direct implications. And I know Confession and absolution is very important. I've learned that in my own life. But I'm going to speak more specifically with baptism and the Lord's Supper because I think that's the one where we have some greater issues. This has direct implications for baptismal practice, and it has direct implications for the practice of closed communion. When it comes to this idea that, yes, the promise of Christ in these sacraments is powerful, and yet There needs to be faith for them to be efficacious for the recipients, not only then, but on an ongoing basis. And that's where I think we have a significant issue in our church today. And it's not necessarily anything new. In doing my own research regarding the struggle of how we look at or perceive baptism or the Lord's Supper, I was amazed And I know I went through this at seminary, but for some reason it wasn't on my radar screen at the time. But when I went through some of Walther's writings in his Long Gospel, the 34th lecture on the proper distinction of Long Gospel, he brings about discussions and a lot of points on problems in the church, in the early Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, with both clergy and members of our congregations looking to the sacraments in an ex opere operato manner. That is, looking at them as if they are efficacious merely by the act and not by the faith which grasps or initially receives and then continues to grasp what is given in the sacrament. And yet apparently it was a big problem in the early Missouri Synod, and it really hasn't gone away, frankly, today either. Yeah, as you talk about that there, I think this is an important distinction to make and a very important clarification. Uh, so thanks for bringing that in. And we saw this when we talked about the Lord's Supper. We specifically highlighted this, that, you know, it's Christ's word that makes the sacrament, right? And we want to be very clear on that, that it conveys what it says because the power is in Christ's word. But then we talked about, you know, this, but it's not efficacious without faith. In fact, It can actually even be detrimental. And I think Mm -hmm. this is something that we want to talk about too here a little bit. And we see that with the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, right? Some of you are sick and dying because you're not receiving this in a worthy manner, right? Essentially, without faith. 
And I think as it relates to baptism, and we often don't talk this way, but I think we can, that not only is it not efficacious without faith, but it can be detrimental. And what made me think of this was a couple of weeks ago in the one-year lectionary that I follow in my dual parish, and we had an oculi, the third Sunday in Lent, we had that reading from Luke chapter 11, where Jesus casts out the mute demon, right? Uh, the demon-possessed man that was mute. And Jesus gives us that teaching there that when it casts out a demon, you know, it goes through the waterless places and finding no rest, it comes back to where it's all swept and clean and put in order with seven more demons. And the state of that person will be worse than the first. And I think that's important for us to highlight here that, you know, when we do a baptism, of course, the old baptismal rites, especially Luther's time, had a little We called it the minor exorcism. That's what baptism is. It's a casting out of the devil, right? And saying that the devil has no claim on this child. But if we're not going to support that in the faith, it's actually worse for them than it was at first. It's worse than had we not done a baptism. And again, that gets very touchy as you talk about it with folks and so forth. But I do think that this is an important distinction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of the biggest struggles we have right now, often a struggle of very well-meaning people who, for example, maybe want a baptism for someone, maybe a, a little child of someone who has no connection with Christ church, which, hey, that's great. What a great opportunity to do evangelism. But on the other hand, what if they just kind of want the baptism done, but they don't necessarily want the idea of being part of a church address. They're not really interested in that. They just really want the baptism, whether that's parents or grandparents or what have you. Then it becomes very problematic because when it comes to baptism, it's really part of the greater command to make disciples. And once we're baptized, it really is like picking a fight with the devil because he has us before we're baptized. But once we're baptized... And we're made clean, and as you mentioned with reference to that passage in Luke, the house is swept clean. That's when the devil really wants to come after us. It's not accidental or merely coincidental that when Jesus is baptized, immediately he goes out for a 40-day period of trial and testing. When we are baptized, we immediately enter our 40 days, I'll use finger quotes there, But the rest of our life from the moment we're baptized is a period of trial and testing. And we need to continue to be nurtured in the faith because while, yes, baptism now saves you, Peter writes, baptism and faith go together. And while the powerful promises of Christ are there in baptism, the baptism is only efficacious or saving as faith continues to grasp the gift that was given. And so we can be much worse off if we don't continue to believe in Christ after we're baptized. And that's why I think Christ's command is put forth the way it is and why it's so important to understand what Christ actually commands in Matthew 28. Uh, I'll make an what some might see as a rather outrageous statement, but I'll say this. I am not called as a pastor to baptize. Wait a second, Pastor Sims. What do you mean you're not called by God to baptize people? If not you, who else? Well, let me clarify. I am not called to merely baptize. I am called to make disciples by baptizing and teaching. And because the connection between baptism and faith is so important, those two things need to go together. Because the Holy Spirit uses means, His Word, and the instruction in the Word, to continue to keep the baptized in faith. And so, oftentimes we will get requests for baptism, very well-intended, loving people who want a baptism done, but they're not necessarily so concerned about the child being baptized into the church. I'm always very careful in those instances not to say, no, we won't baptize your child, but I'm also very careful to make sure that what we say is, yes, we would love to baptize this little one, 
but we need to do it the way Christ would desire and intend it. So let's talk about baptizing this child into Christ's church. Even if it's maybe a distant person who's going to be in town visiting a relative or something like that. Well, we could still do the baptism with some instruction if there is another church for that child to be connected to, you know, where they actually live and so forth and so on. Because we're to baptize people into Christ's church for that continued relationship so that faith may continue to grow. Because the devil comes after the baptized with much greater ferocity than he ever does those who are not baptized, because he's already got them. And so, we want to make sure that we baptize people into the church so that that faith can continue to be nurtured and grow, because then that baptism will truly be efficacious. It will be a blessing and will be to their salvation. Uh, Let me ask you this question, Sean. If someone is baptized, but then they fall away from the faith into which they were baptized and they no longer believe, does that baptism save them? Well, I think this relates back again to the previous article on repentance, right? Right. That what is needed is to come in repentance with faith. Again, the power of Christ's work at baptism to save is still powerful, but it's not efficacious without that faith in coming again in repentance. Right. And so we want people to have that continued faith into the very salvation into which they were baptized. You see this in Jesus' words in Mark 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, whoever does not believe will be condemned. And that has all kinds of implications for it. But faith grasps what's given in baptism as we continue to be nurtured. But sometimes if we're looking at baptism as a one-time act that, well, as long as we just get this done, everything will be fine. Well, there is power in that one-time act, but it's a continuing act that continues to be efficacious for us, and that's even given to us in the basic words of the teaching of the small catechism. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. And on that same note, It's not as if something like baptism and faith work in opposition to each other, and they're competing against one another, but they work in symphony. You know, sometimes I'll get that question, what saves, pastor, baptism or faith? And the answer is yes. They work together in harmony, and that's just how Christ uses baptism and faith together to save us. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were talking there, too, I found myself thinking through a lot of how this plays out, especially as you were talking about, you know, someone who may want to come from out of town for a baptism. Uh, You and I, you're in Chester, Illinois. I'm outside of Steelville and Wine Hill. And, uh, you know, full disclosure, you're my circuit visitor right now, at least for now. I'm leaving you in a couple weeks and going to a new call in Iowa. I know, and we're going to miss you. But, you know, so as we currently are in very close proximity to one another, We have the great pleasure to serve congregations that go back to the 1800s and the beginning of the Synod. We're right across the river from the original home in Perry County, Missouri. You actually have the bridge there in Chester that jumps right on over there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we want to be very clear here first. And what I'm about to say, we're not speaking against any specific parishioners in what I'm about to say or anything like that. We certainly do not do that. Wonderful saints that we're called to serve and to teach them these things. But One of the places that we often see this is that you've got five generations of your family that have been baptized, especially in my context here, at that literal baptismal font in that church, right? And so in one sense, yeah, it's a beautiful thing that they would want to come from out of town, you know, life has taken them for work or whatever else off to another place, but they still value that connection to where their family first came over from Germany and were raised on the farms or whatever have you. And that's a beautiful thing. We certainly want to do that. The problem comes oftentimes of when that family has moved away and they're not connected to any church. They're not being strengthened in the faith. And 
I've even had it said to me at a couple of times, you know, like, pastor, I can't believe you're against doing baptisms. <laughs> and I think you stated the situation really well. You know, I'm not against doing baptisms. I'm against doing something that merely to connect in again to how the article speaks here, only to awaken the faith. But we also confess that it is to confirm it is, you know, we are called to make disciples. And that is, as you said so well, carried out in baptizing and teaching as Jesus gives us in the institution of it. And sometimes we have this issue also with the Lord's Supper, right? That, you know, again, raised here, their families from here have been through the rite of confirmation in the Lutheran church, but they've gone off and they've disconnected themselves from the church or maybe even started attending a different confession and things like that. They don't move their membership, you know, all those struggles that we have with these old, you know, (laughs) heritage churches, I call them. (laughs) <laughs> but they come back for Easter or something like that. And then all of a sudden show up at our rail. And I say, wow, this is uncomfortable, right? Because there's a disconnect going on here in what we confess about this. It's not just merely going through the work of this or at one time you went through this and it's okay. You know, faith is required and faith is lived out in a specific confession as well. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I would give an amen or a ditto to pretty much everything that you just said. It it is a beautiful thing when you have these heritage churches and they go back so many different generations. But yeah, it can become a little bit difficult when they still kind of perceive the church where mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa, or maybe where they grew up as kind of their home church, but yet they've gone other places and maybe even joined other confessions. And then that becomes you know, obviously problematic, but yet they always see a connection to that home church where they were raised, but they're missing the idea that, well, what faith is actually believed? And, and, you know, the sacraments are powerful, and that's why we need to administer them in the most careful and loving way. And so, whether it's baptism without connecting to the church, that would be one of the most unloving things that I could actually do for the baptized. Because it's kind of like picking a fight with the devil and just kind of patting the little baptized child on the back and saying, go get him, kid. That would not be helpful at all. Same with the Lord's Supper. I often hear, and I I know you probably do too, although not as often, uh, I think people start to understand it after a while as we continue to teach it, the practice of closed communion, oftentimes people see as one of the most unloving things that a church could do. And especially in this culture that we're in now of tolerance and inclusion and so forth and so on. Boy, that's about the most unloving thing you could do, Pastor Sims, is tell someone, no, they shouldn't receive the sacrament. I would put forth that the practice of closed communion is one of the most loving things that we can ever do as pastors. Not because we don't want people to receive Christ's body and blood, but because we want them to receive it in a worthy manner that actually trusts what is being given and received, and also in true confessional unity, both of which we see stressed in the New Testament life of the church. Because that's when these things are truly received in an efficacious manner, not simply by receiving them or going through the motions and doing them, but because of what is believed as they receive it. Absolutely. So well stated and so much more that we could talk about on just all sorts of contemporary applications of why this confession of the use of the sacraments that we have here in Article 13, it wasn't just for that time with a confession to the Roman Catholic Church about what our Lutheran churches were teaching, but does still matter for us today. And as you said to me off air at our break, we could really do a whole hour just on that. And mm-hmm. well, maybe we'll keep that in mind uh, for something to do as kind of, we also take up confessional topics. I think that'd be a worthy thing to take up at some time. But with just one minute left here, how do you want to wrap us up today and connect this to how does this article set up what's coming next in the Augsburg Confession? Well, you see coming up in the Augsburg Confession, you've got order in the church. That's so important. You know, oftentimes when it comes to the sacraments and the use of them, sometimes people don't necessarily care for organized church. Although, listen, if you want to see organized church, 
look at the New Testament. <laughs> it's all over the place. It's not like there was no organized church until modern times. There's order for a reason, because the sacraments are powerful, and we want them to be received in faith for the blessing of the recipients. That's a big one there. And then, of course, we've got things, everything from church ceremonies to the Mass, all of which play into this as well. Yeah, so that'll be uh, what we take up next week then as we will look at Article 14 of the Augsburg Confession on Order in the Church. Thanks for joining us today, and thank you, Pastor Timothy Sims, for joining us and teaching us this Lutheran Confession of the use of the sacraments from Article 13 of the Augsburg Confession. It's been a great pleasure having you join us today. It's been a humble privilege, and it's a humble privilege to uh, have the Lord call us to actually administer these sacraments. May the Lord have mercy on us. Such a humble calling it is for us. Absolutely. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church.